all that. Uh, honey, what else did I need to, you, did I need to announce anything else? Oh, about the... Um, oh, yeah, I was going to tell you, yesterday manager. I ran to the general manager up here, and he said, man, I hear that Bible study is going great. And I said, yeah, we are, we're just having a good time. Folks are coming and seem to enjoy themselves. And he said, well, that's what we're hearing. He said, I'm thinking that probably next winter you're probably going to need the big dining room up here yeah. uh, for space and then also uh, the parking. You know, yeah. I thought for parking. I was trying to get Whit and, and Ron and, and uh, Luke to kind of start doing valet parking. But somehow they're not. <laughs> We said, hey, I don't need to run you back. <laughs> All right, well, listen, let's get going. I want to start this morning by telling you something funny because right now we need a little funny, a little humor, a little levity because our world is pretty difficult if you watch the news and what's going on. So anyway, this guy and his wife are in the car. They're driving down the street. Policeman, let red lights come on, pulls the guy over. Policeman walks up to him and he said, you know you were driving 65 and a 55? And he said, no, I wasn't. His wife spoke up and said, yes, you were. <laughs> he said, I'm going to give you a ticket for driving 60, 10 miles on the speed limit. He said, also, your taillight's busted. Are you serious? I didn't know that it was. His wife said, I told you two weeks ago. <laughs> you said you were going to fix it. You didn't. <laughs> so then he said, uh, ask another question. I don't remember what it was. But anyway, she, the wife stepped in and responded again. Husband looks over and says, I'm telling you, you sit there, you keep your mouth shut, you don't say another word. The policeman looked at the woman and said, does your husband always talk to you like that? She said, no, only when he's drunk. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you call unsolicited input. <laughs> uh, pass out some of those and Lou, come get the other side on your side of the room. Here, go give me some up here, and we'll get Lou to hand some out over here. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> now, what's being handed out this morning is some of you have been coming. You know, weeks ago I gave you a prophecy timeline, and then I went back and filled in the scripture verses. And the reason I wanted to redistribute that again today is because I want you to know where we are on God's prophetic clock. Now, we've been talking in these weeks about what's next, what's coming at us. And I've said it before, I'll say it again today. I'm not into speculation. The purpose of our study is to look into the Word of God and see what the Word of God says about biblical prophecy, especially in the last days, because... Opinions don't matter. What matters is what God has said. And so we want to look at what the Bible says because the Bible is the only reliable source for what the future holds. Because only God, who's been to the end of time, can look back. And again, our theme verse for this whole time has been Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10. And he said, For I am God and there is none other. I'm God and there's none like me declaring or making known the end from the beginning. <laughs> So what we've taken, done is we've put together a timeline for you, and as you look at the timeline across the way, you'll be able to uh, see some things that, and, and we're going to talk about how we got here and so forth and so on, but before we do that, let me put a slide up here because I thought this was really good. Uh, we were in church yesterday at First Baptist Church in Sarasota. The pastor made this statement I thought it was so good I wrote it down. Information without application and transformation is an abomination. And the reason I want to put that up today is because I am not here just to provide information. <clears throat> the purpose of our information is to take those truths that are contained in the Word of God, apply it to our life, and allow the Holy Spirit of God to transform us in that process that is ongoing from the day we put our faith and trust in Jesus until the day He takes us home. We're in the growth mode, and He's making us more into his image. That is what he does. And so we're in the process of being transformed, but if we're not, something is very wrong with that. You know, there are people who know a lot about the Bible, but they're on the broad road that leads to destruction because you can know a lot about the Bible, but if you don't know the God of the Bible, then you've missed it. And that's the great tragedy today is that so many people know a lot and they're very religious but they've never 
had a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so you know me, I'm a relationship guy. That's what it's all about. So that said, I want to look at the timeline a little bit because we, uh, we're now living in the church age. This is the age of grace. It started on the day of Pentecost when uh, uh, the church was born on that day in Acts chapter 2. We talked about the rebirth of the nation of Israel, but then also we got into the rapture of the church. The verses are there, followed by the Islamic inv- the death of America, the, the Islamic invasion. And by the way, we're going to be talking more about where we are in America in a few minutes. But the New World Order, the appearing of the Antichrist, all of these things happen after we are gone. In other words, when the rapture occurs, following that, we're going to see the demise of America as we know it. Why? We said because you can't have a coming one world government, which the Bible teaches we will have, and have a country or nation that's a superpower that's a democracy. So America as we know it is going away. And believe me, if you're paying attention to what's going on, if you're not living under a rock, I'm telling you, America that we knew, birthed on 1776, birthed on the principle of religious freedom, birthed on the teaching of the Word of God, etc., etc., all of this is being rapidly stripped away from us in the country in which we live. Well, then we have this coming Russian-led Islamic invasion of Israel. And isn't it interesting that we now have Vladimir Putin in the war with Ukraine, we have a Russian Air Force stationed on the northern border of Israel in Syria, and then we have Iran firing, firing 12 rockets into Iraq at our U.S. consulate there. Fortunately, no one got hit with that. But the Iranians were sending a message. We know from Ezekiel chapter 38, 39, that a Russian leader will lead an Islamic coalition against the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. And I would submit to you that Ukraine is a test. Vladimir Putin is testing to see if we and the Western world, but especially America, would respond in any way to his incursion into Ukraine. And he's realized that truly the administration is in Washington is as weak as he thought it was, or more so. So we're not doing anything which really gives him the green light to do anything he wants to. And believe me, he had no intention of stopping just with the Ukraine. He wants to restore the former KGB agent. He wants to restore the ancient Soviet Union in that part of the world. But more importantly, he wants Israel, the oil reserves, the natural gas reserves, the minerals of the Dead Sea, and so forth. But, but what he doesn't know is, is that his future is actually written about in the Word of God. Because in Ezekiel 30 and 39, it says God puts a hook in his jaw, draws him down upon the mountains of Israel, and God slaughters them. And you know the rest of this, those of you who've been with us, takes seven months to bury the dead. Massive carnage. He destroys this Muslim enemy. He then takes seven years. They use weapons of warfare as fuel. And we talked about how uh, the Department of Defense issued a statement about how a nuclear spent a spent nuclear device continues to emit and generate energy for a time period of seven years isn't that interesting we said that half of the bible's history 25 percent is prophecy 25 percent is how we should live our lives on a day-by-day basis on all of those things when god records it it's always accurate that's the wonderful thing and that's why i love the real reliability of the word of god well then ultimately we have as a result of this massive mess, we have the birth of a new world order. A peace treaty is going to be signed between the <coughs> Antichrist who comes upon the scene with a plan for world peace. And then, of course, eventually there will be a temple. Once this peace treaty is signed, part of that agreement will be that the Jewish people will get to rebuild their temple in the city of Jerusalem. Because where the Dome of the Rock stands right now, which was built between the years of 687 and 691, by the Muslims who came up from the peninsula of Saudi Arabia, they had built on the spot where, the, or near the spot where the temple was, that is, uh, the final temple, we'll look at this in a moment, and that will be ultimately destroyed, that is, the Dome of the Rock, with that great earthquake in Ezekiel chapter 39. So <clears throat> we're now coming to, last week, we dealt with the rebuilding of the temple in Daniel 9.27. Now, I want to pause for a moment, and if you have your Bible, I want you to take it. If you don't have it, no problem. You might have it on a phone or whatever. Maybe you could look on with someone else. But I want to remind us of something that Jesus said. So Matthew chapter 24, very quickly, if you have a Bible, turn there. If not, make a note, whatever. Because I want you to know what 
the scriptures say, Jesus in teaching his most comprehensive teaching <clears throat> concerning the last days uh, is with the disciples there on the Temple Mount in the city of Jerusalem. And Herod's temple was standing at that time. And so in verse 1, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see, you see all these things he asked? I mean, it's almost like they're giving Jesus this uh, walking tour of the temple complex as if he didn't know anything about it. <clears throat> so to call his attention, do you see all these things he asked? I'll tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left with another. Now, we talked last week about how in 135 A.D., Hadrian, the Roman emperor, uh, ordered that the, the ground upon which where the temple had stood would be mowed under the Romans, of course, in 70 A.D., destroyed the temple, but ultimately to that, later they virtually plowed asunder the 35 acres of the temple mount. Every stone was turned over or thrown down, just like Jesus was telling the disciples. But they came to him on the Mount of Olives. So following that conversation, they went out through the eastern gate over to the Mount of Olives on the east. Jesus went and sat down. The disciples came to him. Now, Mark tells us it was only Peter and John and James and Andrew, the kind of the inner four, not all of them. But they asked this question. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So those questions, they were curious about that. Are you curious about that? What will be the sign of your coming? What will be, you want be uh, uh, people down through the ages have obviously been interested to know this. And Jesus once said, watch out that no one deceives you. And he goes on to talk about how there would be many who would claim to be Christ and would receive many. You'll hear wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation, the Greek word is ethnos. So we get our word ethnicity from that. So, uh, Ethnicity will rise against ethnicity, kingdom against kingdom, famine, earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is what I want you to get this morning. And I've said this before, I repeat this. I think, I think repetition is a great teacher, amen? amen? So what happens, we walk in the room today, we flip the light switch on. Instantaneously, it goes from darkness to daylight. That's not how biblical prophecy works in Scripture. God says something will happen. And it will happen for sure, but it normally is incremental movements over time. So what happened was, Jesus said all these things are going to take place. They're like birth pains. Okay? So as you ladies well know, uh, <clears throat> first of all, the pains begin, but they get more intense, and they get more frequent, right? Methane gas that animals expel. And so for the sake of our climate control, we will have less meat to eat. A billion people will be displaced by climate change. Climate change, and I'm not trying to be political, but I am a common sense person. Climate change is the biggest hoax ever perpetrated on the world, and especially on the American people. Amen. One of the things about evangelical believers, we get criticized about not caring for our environment. We care about the environment. But we're not stupid. We, what, we go back and know that climate is <coughs> cyclical. And it has been. And we have the documentation to verify it. But there is a select group of people who have become multi-billionaires, <coughs> namely Al Gore for one, John Kerry for another. I could go on and on and on. They're making, a, making millions, if not billions, of dollars off of promoting this. And I got news for you. The polar bears are not dying. They're not. And so this is, we, we have been lied to by complicit media that is propagating this idea of this religion of climate change because that's, that's what it is. It's a religion today. Then you could be preparing to go to Mars. I don't know what that's all about, but hey, there's no question that we'll do, be doing further exploration into space. And then Western values will have been tested to their breaking point. But I want to show you something. They used Western values. What they really mean are biblical values. Will, be, will have been tested to their breaking point. Because they couldn't use biblical up there. Because you see, if you put biblical values, then indirectly what you're really saying is, there's a creator God. Whoa, we can't go there. Because today on the major university campuses in America, 
if you're a tenured professor, you can't talk about any of this stuff because if you do, you're going to have holy hell to live with. And if you're not tenured, you're going to get fired. And so these are taboo to talk about <coughs> biblical values. And what are the biblical values? Yesterday I was playing golf with a guy in a game I played on Monday. Really a nice guy. And he was telling me all about the work that he does. He's uh, very involved, still working, 75, and uh, has a really important position with a large corporation, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> told me all about it. It's really quite fascinating what he does. And then he asked me what I did. And so I told him, you know, I'm a preacher, a minister, and so forth and so on, and, and all. And, and I had yesterday, I had on my red, white, and blue outfit. Okay, I have my flag shirt on, a red, white, and blue shoes, a red, white, and blue belt, a red, white, and blue cap, a red glove. All my head covers in my bag are red, white, and blue. Because that's what it is. And the Ten Commandments, the Sixth Commandments, are very clear about that. That said, I said, and then, for example, I also believe in uh, marriage. As God defined marriage. God says, for this reason, God created a male and a female, and the two should be joined together. And so marriage is defined in Scripture as a man and as a woman. And I've already told you all this, and we have, each of our sons, believe it or not, we have granddaughters who live their lives as lesbians. They're married to another woman. Do we love them? Absolutely. Do we... Um, uh, do we uh, approve of what they did? Absolutely not. We'll always love them, but we're never going to agree with them because God doesn't agree with them. And then I said, you know, and also, I said, I'm a capitalist. The Bible teaches capitalism. And the Bible says a man doesn't work, he doesn't deserve to eat. And he went on to say about, well, you know, the government sometimes does do some things right. They, you know, help feed people and so forth. I said, and unfortunately, that's true, but that's really not the job of government. The, the job of the, ch of the churches in this country are the ones who should be providing those kinds of services to the widows and the orphans and the people who are in need. And by the way, there's no group in the world as generous as the American people, and there's no group of American people more generous than Bible-believing Christians. We give the lion's share. Joe and Jill Biden gave in 2020 their total charitable donations were $300. You're going to find that among evangelical Bible-believing Christians, we have the most giving heart that you could possibly imagine, and we've proven that over and over again. So these are biblical values, and so I encourage you, don't let anybody try to beat you down because you take a stand on the truths of God's Word. Uh, I'm not a politician, have no desire to be a politician, but I want to stand on biblical truth, and, and people are trying to shut us up all the time. Believe me. You'd be shocked if you saw some of the, well, you might not, but anyway, you'd probably be shocked if you saw some of the emails and things that I get from time to time. I was in Israel with a group, and I've been teaching uh, there, and it's been about four years ago, I guess. <clears throat> and uh, as I walked away, uh, after I finished and I was walking away, this couple came up to me and they said, we just want you to know that we don't agree with everything you say. And I started laughing. I said, really? You sound just like my wife. <laughs> I mean, seriously? You think? You think that I think that you agree? I mean, nobody agrees with everything I say, for sure. And they said, well, mainly this is on the issue of, of abortion. And I said, it bothers you because I was had been teaching at Megiddo where the ancient Canaanites had slaughtered their children on this huge altar that was unveiled back a number of years ago. The archaeologists did their excavation work there. And <clears throat> so anyway, they said, yeah, we, we just want you to know we, we don't agree with that. We think it's an argument. And they said, no, we were invited by some friends, but we wish we hadn't come. <laughs> and I said, gee, you know, I'm really sorry about that because... This is an incredible life-changing experience and, you know, the Bible, the history, and you know, I, I'm really sorry that you feel uh, that way about that. I said, maybe, you know, you'll feel better before it's over with. So, and I said, if there's anything else I can do to help you, please don't hesitate to let me know. So they went on their way, and we just kind of agreed to disagree. And uh, I just kept on doing what I do. And so the last day at the Garden Tomb, we 
In their own words, the UN, like Schwab, wants to ensure that by 2030, poverty, hunger, environmental pollution and disease no longer exist on Earth. It sounds like a sympathetic plan, until you read the fine print. You see, the idea is that Agenda 2030 is going to be paid for by us, the citizens. And just as it is currently required of us that we give up our basic rights for the sake of public health, we will be demanded to give up our wealth in favor of poverty reduction. These are not conspiracy theories. You can read this for yourself on their official website. In short, it boils down to this. The UN wants to take the tax money from all Western countries and give it to the mega corporations of the elite who will be contracted to rebuild society. Globally, a completely new infrastructure is needed because fossil fuels must be made a thing of the past, according to the UN. For this immense project, a world government is needed, says the UN. And the same UN takes it upon herself to be this global government. Just like Schwab, the UN also believes that a pandemic is the perfect opportunity to accelerate the implementation of Agenda 2030. It is worrisome that the WEF and the UN openly admit that they consider pandemics and other disasters as an opportunity to transform society, especially since we have seen that the elite have all the resources at their disposal to make us believe that there is a pandemic, and even to create one. So we certainly should not take these things lightly, and we should examine them carefully. And when we do that, we come across things that are even more troubling. On Friday, October 18, 2019, months before the pandemic was declared, a meeting was held at the Pierre Hotel in New York City for a select group of about 130 very important guests, including politicians and the world's most respected medics and pharmacists. The purpose of the meeting was to simulate the possible scenarios in the event of a global pandemic. This could be a coincidence, you might say. For this simulation, however, a coronavirus was used as an example. The simulation covered in detail how the coronavirus would develop and how they could only control this through the intensive collaboration of entire industries, governments and government agencies. Once again, a new world order to save us from destruction. Does it surprise you when I tell you that this meeting, called Event 201, was organized by none other than the World Economic Forum, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the John Hopkins Institute? This is not a conspiracy theory. Check the official website of Event 201 for yourself. We could talk for hours about the coronavirus, which has a survival rate of 99.98%, and about the incomprehensible measures that are destroying our society. Millions of entrepreneurs have lost their income. Countless elderly people have died in loneliness, isolated from their families. But I think we have reviewed enough facts that put the global COVID measures in a broader context, seen from the perspective of the elite. This extremely wealthy elite, collectively of tens of thousands of billions, has no problem whatsoever with the fact that more than 40% of the world's population has to live on less than five and a half dollars a day, or that millions of children are dying from the drinking water contaminated by them, or from malnutrition, or by their bullets and bombs. They just want to get more powerful. The elite have absolutely no intention to share their wealth with us. In fact, they are honest about their plans to take even the last bit from us. And those plans are being rolled out as I'm telling this. The underlying motives of the elite will not be explained in this episode. Because for this, we have to dive into history and discuss topics that are beyond our modern rational thinking. But for now, you may understand well enough with the simple logic that a new world order or an all-encompassing world government is the only way for a small elite to retain its power over an ever-increasing world population. 
Companies like BlackRock and Vanguard do not benefit from national borders, import taxes, and real diversity. Only through fear. I'm going to kill that <coughs> there because uh, this is a uh, still ain't got 18 minutes in it, and, and you're getting the general idea, I think. The question I would ask you how many of you have kids and grandkids? All of us, pretty much, I guess. So, why would we be concerned about what's going on? <clears throat> because we have kids and grandkids. And the crux of the matter is, is that by and large, how many of you before today had heard of the WEF? Okay, this is a pretty well informed group. So many people have no idea this organization even exists. They have no understanding of why during the pandemic, quote unquote pandemic, you could go to Walmart or Lowe's or, uh, or Costco or whatever and buy what you wanted, but right down the street, Mary and Joe, De uh, Joe De Doe, who had a clothing store, they had to shut down. So the same things that were sold at the big box stores, entrepreneurs, business owners were in big trouble because they were shut down. That, that made no common sense whatsoever. But again, you gotta realize everything is aimed at padding the pockets. And so I wanted you to be aware of it. And the reason is, is because we hear the word, the word uh, new world order. Uh, you know, I get on American Airlines and said, one world, it's a one world airline thing. We don't realize the depth of number one, that the Bible teaches there will be a new world order. Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, the book of Revelation. It will be controlled by 10, because the plan, in case you're not aware of this, has already been laid out, that the, 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 the earth will be divided into 10 biozones, and each one of those biozones will have one leader over that zone, which will report to a single issue that we're dealing with. Deception is a dangerous thing, and it can harm us not only spiritually, but physically. And because we have kids and grandkids like you all do, we want to make sure that we know what's going on so that we can inform them. And I'll give you an illustration. I was preaching in Reno, Nevada. It was July 4th weekend. I preached a message on America and our birth and so forth and so on, how we came to be, and uh, <laughs> made some comments in my message about Christopher Columbus. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but Christopher Columbus was a devout Christ follower. In fact, his name, Christopher, means Christ bearer. And uh, uh, so today, of course, we have a different... Isn't it interesting that one of the things they want to get rid of so desperately are fossil fuels? Do you know one of the reasons why? Not only because they have a global climate agenda, a green agenda, but, it's, but fossil fuels, now listen, I'm about to tell you, Fossil fuels are a testimony that there's a creator God and that there was a flood. You know where oil and gas comes from? Certainly. The fossil bed largely deposited during a worldwide, not a local little washout, but a worldwide flood when everything living on the face of the earth was destroyed with the exception of Noah and his wife and their three sons and their wives, a total of eight people. That is a testimony to the fact that there was such an event that they try so hard to deny. But anyway, that's another subject. But finally, my point in all this is, is that we're dealing with younger people and, and most grandparents that I meet really don't know what their grandkids believe. We, you know, because we, we don't really get into those conversations with them as, as, you know, per se. And yet we need to. Because, see, your own children I don't know where they went to school. For example, our, one of our granddaughters graduated from the University of Arkansas, then got her law degree up there, grew up in uh, a Christian environment, and she will argue with you till the, till the cows come home about why abortion is okay. And all. But see, she never believed that stuff before until she got brainwashed. And what scares me is she's an attorney. One of our other granddaughters, who is married to another woman, she teaches... Uh, part-time on the university level. That scares me to death. Mm -hmm. To think that she's teaching other children, other people, her own foolish ideas. So, the bottom line is, we need to be informed. Don't think this is not important prophetically or biblically, because it is. And so, this is why I took the time to share it with you today. I'm grateful that you came. 
Let's pray together and I'm going to let you out of here, okay? Father, we just take this opportunity to come boldly to the throne of grace today. In the name of Jesus, we're told that we have automatic entrance into your presence. We're grateful to you for your incredible love, for your death on the cross, your burial in the grave, the fact that you rose from that grave, ascended into heaven with the promise that one day you're going to call us home. One day you will come back and rightly retake what belongs to you, reclaim this earth. And so we just simply love you today. Thank you for every precious person sitting in this room. For those who will watch this uh, video uh, by other means, we're so thankful for the authority, accuracy, reliability of the Word of God. Thank you that we don't have to be in the dark with regard to the future. You have given us a glimpse of what is going to happen. While we don't know a day or an hour, we do see the world stage being set and your word being unfolded right before our very eyes. Help us to be engaged. Help us to be men and women of prayer. Help us to study our Bible so that we might know you more intimately than ever before. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless all of you. Thank you. Good to see you. See you next week. Hopefully,